All right. Greetings to all. Uh, welcome uh, to the CILE Academy Distinguished Speakers uh, Lecture. And today we are absolutely delighted and honored to have as our distinguished speaker, Judge Jin Kyung Pig um, from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, and just a Brief overview because Judge Paik has a very rich career in international law, but he has been a member of the tribunal since uh, 2009. Um, he was the president of the tribunal between 2017 and 2020. Um, he is currently a member, oh wait, he was a member of the special chamber formed to deal with the dispute concerning delimitation of the maritime boundary between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in the Atlantic Ocean. He is president of the special chamber, and I believe it's the first one formed to deal with the dispute concerning delimitation of the maritime boundary between Mauritius and Maldives in the Indian Ocean. Um, he was arbitrated in Enrique Lexi incident case, president of the arbitral tribunal of the dispute concerning Coastal State Rights in the Black Sea, Sea of Azov and Kurt Strait. So he has uh, been very active on the tribunal. He has a very rich experience in international law uh, in Korea as legal advisor to the foreign ministry. Um, and of course, he's, he is professor of international law at the Graduate School of International Studies, Seoul National University. So it's my great pleasure um, to introduce Judge Paik who will lecture us today on dispute settlement under the Law of the Sea Convention. Judge Paik. Uh, thank you, Nilufar, for your kind invitation. Um, I'm pleased to uh, give this lecture for participants of uh, CILE Academy. And uh, now let me uh, share my um, slides. Um, <clears throat> uh, today, uh, I want to uh, talk briefly about the uh, dispute settlement system under the Law of Sea Convention and uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, uh, of course, uh, Law of Sea Convention. I, I, I don't know whether a student, you have uh, uh, much background uh, in the Law of Sea. I believe you have, uh, but uh, anyway, Law of Sea Convention is a comprehensive uh, uh, treaty, uh, 320 articles, uh, nine annexes. It really uh, addresses every aspect of the oceans. Therefore, it is not difficult to imagine uh, many disputes can arise from uh, application of this convention. So from the beginning of the third UN conference on the law of sea in the 1970s, um, participants uh, uh, realize uh, the need for an effective system of dispute settlement. Such system was necessary uh, in their view uh, to settle many disputes that could arise uh, uh, from the convention. In addition, perhaps more importantly, uh, this convention uh, can be interpreted and applied by parties, state parties, uh, differently. Uh, 
then uh, uh, again, it's not very difficult to see uh, there would be huge uh, uncertainties uh, and uh, uh, disorder, you know. Uh, so participants of the Law of Sea Conference uh, uh, saw the need uh, to have especially international court and tribunal authoritatively interpreting and applying the provision of the convention. Uh, so they uh, uh, wanted to have an effective system of dispute settlement. This was in fact uh, uh, contained in now part 15 of the convention uh, which deals with the dispute settlement. Uh, you know, uh, one thing I want to say about part 15 is uh, this uh, dispute settlement system is integral part of the convention. It is part 15, you know, of the convention. So once you become a, a party to law of the sea convention, you are also uh, become a party to the dispute settlement system of the law of sea convention. This arrangement is different from arrangement of uh, 1958 Geneva Conventions on the law of the sea. Uh, in the case of uh, Geneva Convention, there was separate optional protocol on the dispute settlement. Uh, so uh, it was possible in case of 1958 Geneva Convention that you can become a uh, party to, for example, territorial sea convention, and uh, but still you don't have to be a party to uh, dispute settlement uh, of uh, you know uh, those uh, conventions. Uh, however, in case of uh, UNCLOS, uh, uh, dispute settlement system is an integral part of the convention. Uh, I will briefly uh, go through this new settlement on system under the convention, but uh, uh, I want to say that uh, this new sy settlement system uh, uh, in part 15 is a careful balance between freedom and autonomy of parties and compulsory procedures. One of the misunderstandings uh, student, uh, many students uh, have about uh, uh, the dispute settlement system under the convention is, uh, uh, it is a compulsory system, compulsory, you know, uh, procedure. Uh, in fact, uh, this uh, compulsory procedure is uh, really the centerpiece of dispute settlement system, but it is not everything, you know, it's only one component of this uh, comprehensive dispute settlement system. In fact, if you look at the uh, part 15 carefully, Law of the Sea Convention, in fact, encourage uh, parties to dispute, to settle their dispute by their own, you know, uh, means of their own choice, whether uh, those means are negotiation, mediation, conciliation. In fact, the Law of Sea Convention emphasizes uh, con conciliation, you know, uh, or arbitration or judicial settlement. Uh, so uh, uh, overall, you know, uh, uh, dispute settlement system of the Law of Sea Convention is a combination of uh, uh, party autonomy, uh, and uh, compulsory procedures. Part 15 uh, is uh, composed of uh, three sections. Uh, three, section one deals with uh, uh, general provision. Here, uh, the idea of uh, uh, this party's freedom or autonomy, in other words, uh, parties to dispute can settle their dispute uh, by whatever means they agree. Uh, that idea is uh, enshrined in section one. 
Then section two, uh, of course, this is a kind of centerpiece of uh, dispute settlement system. However, when parties are unable to settle their dispute by means of their own choice, then any party to dispute may submit their dispute to compulsory procedures. That is section two. Section three deals with the exceptions, uh, either automatic exception or optional exceptions. So compulsory procedure is subject to those exceptions. So uh, this, uh, uh, this whole picture is uh, rather, you know, uh, elaborate uh, balance uh, between, you know, different uh, ideas. Now, quickly, I don't think I have uh, enough time today, so I won't go into details uh, of uh, those uh, general provision uh, in section one, but idea is uh, 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 parties to a dispute uh, can settle their dispute by peaceful means of their own choice. That is the key. Uh, to this general provision. Uh, however, of course, uh, uh, parties may not be able to do so. In that case, uh, these compulsory procedures uh, can be invoked. Uh, just briefly, uh, compulsory procedure uh, uh, really uh, is, a, is a restriction of the, this fundamental principle of consent. You may know uh, this principle of consent. This is a fundamental principle in, in international judicial proceedings. Uh, namely, no state is compelled or forced to submit its dispute to international court or tribunal without its consent, right? This is a principle of uh, consent. Uh, this principle, of course, uh, comes from uh, the very idea of uh, state sovereignty. Because state is uh, sovereign, uh, no state is uh, compelled or, you know, forced to uh, submit particular method of dispute settlement in the absence of its consent. Uh, compulsory procedure uh, is a kind of restriction of this principle of consent. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, compulsory procedure uh, uh, restricts state's uh, freedom, state's sovereignty to some extent. Uh, therefore, states are uh, you know, it's not difficult to uh, imagine that states are not really uh, uh, willing to accept uh, compulsory procedures. A state has a huge hesitation to accept compulsory procedure. Uh, however, law of sea convention introduced such procedure as an important part of this new settlement. Uh, then, of course, uh, law of sea convention also uh, uh, introduce some safeguards to mitigate concern of uh, state. Uh, there are at least three safeguards. That is uh, conditions, a choice of procedure, and exception. Uh, conditions uh, refer to uh, what I have just explained. Uh, compulsory procedure can be invoked only when parties are not able to settle their dispute by means of uh, their own choice, right? So you cannot go directly into compulsory procedure. First, you are perhaps uh, required to settle your dispute uh, through uh, means of your choice. However, if you cannot do that, then compulsory procedure is, can be involved. Then when compulsory procedure is invoked, there, are, there is so-called choice of procedure. Uh, 
which I will explain shortly. Uh, then also these compulsory procedures are subject to important exceptions, automatic and optional. So let me explain first the choice of procedure. When compulsory procedure is invoked, party to dispute has four choices, which court or tribunal uh, they will submit their dispute to. Uh, those four choices include International Tribunal for the Law of Sea, International Court of Justice, Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal, and Annex 8 Special Arbitral Tribunal. Uh, state party has considerable freedom and flexibility in choosing those procedures. Uh, although it is a compulsory procedure, so state is compelled to submit its dispute to uh, this procedure, but there are some choices you can make among four different court or tribunal, right? Uh, then if parties to a dispute have chosen the same procedure, the disputes dispute goes to that procedure. If not, the dispute goes to the Annex 7 Arbitrary Tribunal. Very interesting. So if there is a dispute between, for example, Singapore and Malaysia, and Singapore chose ITLOS, Malaysia chose ITLOS, then dispute between Singapore and Malaysia uh, goes to ITLOS. However, if Singapore chose ITLOS, Malaysia chose ICJ, then dispute goes neither to ITLOS nor to ICJ. It goes to the tribunal which neither party chose, that is Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. Uh, in addition, if state party has not chosen any procedure, that state party is deemed to have accepted Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. So if I may come back to this dispute between Singapore and Malaysia, uh, then Singapore chose it was Malaysia, Malaysia chose no procedure, then dispute goes to again Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. So we call this Annex uh, 7 arbitral tribunal default forum. Uh, many disputes are submitted to Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal, uh, not as a choice, but as a default. Hmm? So, that it, so Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal is a default forum or residual procedure and so on. Here I show you this uh, statistic briefly as of August 2019. Uh, currently, there are 168 states parties, and out of those uh, states parties, uh, 39 states chose ITLOS, 28 chose ICJ, uh, 8 chose Annex 7, uh, 7 chose Annex 8 special arbitration. So, uh, still uh, more than half of the state's parties to the Lobsy Convention have not chosen any procedure. So as a consequence, many disputes have been submitted to Annex 7 arbitration by operation of Article 80, 287, choice of procedure. Uh, not because largest number of chose Annex 7 arbitral tribunal, but because Annex 7 arbitral tribunal is a default forum. Now, uh, another uh, safeguards uh, uh, are exceptions, automatic exceptions and uh, optional exception. 
automatic exception is called a limitation, limitations on the applicability of compulsory procedures. Uh, three types of disputes uh, uh, under Article 297 of the Convention, three types of uh, disputes are outside, are outside compulsory procedures. They are not subject to uh, compulsory procedures. If you look at uh, you look at Article 297, uh, uh, it's one of the most difficult uh, provisions of the entire convention. Uh, in addition, I may say that uh, it's not the best example of draft draftmanship. Uh, <laughs> so I won't go into detail. It's a very difficult provision and uh, there are many different uh, interpretations of those provisions. But uh, uh, there are certain types of disputes. I can just say that there are certain types of disputes which are not subject to uh, compulsory procedures. Uh, uh, those disputes are mostly related to this uh, exclusive economic zone, uh, and there were huge, you know, uh, debate uh, at the Law of Sea Conference. But anyway, without going further, uh, uh, let me say second type of exception. That is optional exception. Uh, states parties can, uh, uh, if they want, uh, they can exclude uh, certain categories of disputes uh, from compulsory procedure. That is optional because uh, state parties have uh, option to uh, exclude those types of uh, dispute. Again, there are three types of dispute. Uh, first, the disputes concerning uh, boundary delimitation, say boundary delimitation or disputes involving historic base or titles. Second, uh, dispute concerning military activities and dispute concerning law enforcement activities uh, under certain conditions. Third, uh, dispute in respect of which United Nations Security Council is exercising its functions. So, uh, uh, state parties uh, can exercise its option to exclude those categories of dispute from uh, compulsory procedure. There are, uh, uh, I can't remember how many, but uh, uh, at least more than 30 states parties uh, have exercised this option uh, to exclude uh, one or more you know, categories of disputes from compulsory procedures. Now, let me uh, move to International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, the, uh, ITLOS is the only standing tribunal founded by uh, UNCLOS. Uh, ITLOS was uh, founded by uh, uh, Annex 6 uh, of, uh, to the UNCLOS. Um, at the third UN conference on the law of sea, there was a, a debate whether uh, a new court uh, uh, should be created uh, when there is uh, already, there was already uh, International Court of Justice. Uh, uh, um, some states opposed to creation of new uh, international court, uh, but uh, in 1970s, uh, uh, there was uh, uh, some distrust about uh, ICJ, you know, especially after this uh, Southwest Africa, Namibia case, uh, whether uh, ICJ uh, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, impartial uh, in dealing with uh, these cases relating to decolonization and so on. So many developing countries and newly independent countries uh, did have some uh, distrust or suspicion uh, about the ICJ and they strongly uh, uh, you know, uh, put forward this idea of creating new international court uh, uh, dealing with the law of sea dispute. Anyway, it was, was created by UNCLOS. Um, it is a specialized tribunal, specialized court. Uh, ICJ has a general competence. It can deal with any dispute uh, from, uh, you know, uh, use of force, disputes involving use of force, uh, human rights, uh, environment, uh, law of sea, uh, uh, territorial dispute, uh, you just name it. ICJ can deal with any dispute. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, before the establishment of the uh, it was uh, uh, substantial number of uh, disputes the ICJ dealt with uh, uh, were law of sea disputes. And even after uh, uh, creation of it was, ICJ continued to deal with uh, many law of sea disputes. In fact, um, perhaps almost one third of disputes that have been submitted to ICJ, even after uh, it was, was created, were concerned with the law of sea dispute. Anyway, uh, however, law of sea tribunal, it was, is a specialized tribunal dealing with only law of sea disputes. Another feature I want to uh, say briefly is, uh, uh, it was as 21 judges, perhaps the largest number of judges uh, uh, in any international uh, court. And the, one of the question uh, I was asked very frequently uh, was uh, how can court of 21 judges function? <laughs> there was, uh, you know, this uh, uh, question I very frequently encounter. It, it, it functions, it functions well, you know. Uh, um, in fact, uh, it's like many other court or tribunal, we decide uh, by majority. And uh, although we try to uh, reach a decision, you know, uh, with as much, you know, uh, judges on board as possible, as many judges on board as possible. But anyway, we make decision by majority. And uh, uh, I have never felt uh, this number 21 is uh, any serious uh, obstacle to effective functioning of the tribunal. Uh, how those 21 judges uh, uh, distributed uh, in terms of uh, five different geographical groups. Uh, in our statute, uh, there is a provision that there should be no fewer than three members from each geographical groups. There are five geographical groups. Uh, this uh, provision ensure more balanced uh, you know, composition of the tribunal, especially compared to the uh, International Court of Justice. Uh, uh, in case of ICJ, uh, judges from uh, Europe, uh, both Western Europe and others, and Eastern Europe, uh, are almost uh, half of the uh, entire 15 judges. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in our case, uh, uh, judges from Europe, uh, European region, uh, are uh, seven. Uh, so one third, uh, so perhaps more balanced in terms of uh, geographical representation. One more thing, we have uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, body called Seabed Disputes Chamber. Uh, uh, this Seabed Dispute Chamber is a standing chamber 
within a tribunal, within the tribunal, composed of uh, 11 judges out of 21 judges. Uh, every three years, uh, there will be election to select uh, members of Seabed Dispute Chamber. Seabed uh, Dispute Chamber is independent uh, court within the tribunal. Uh, um, uh, so uh, it is called a tribunal within a tribunal, a court within a court. Seabed uh, Dispute Chamber, as I will say, uh, uh, exercises very important functions. Uh, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, all this uh, dispute relating to activities in the area via national ju jurisdiction. Now, uh, uh, relationship between UNCLOS and ITLOS, uh, as you have just seen, ITLOS is one of the four means of compulsory uh, dispute settlement on the Article 287, right? Uh, together with uh, ICJ uh, and two types of arbitration. Uh, it is not a default forum. Uh, Annex 7 arbitration is a default forum. It is not a default forum. However, uh, it was, has a special status as the guardian of UNCLOS. Uh, you know, uh, nowhere in the convention, uh, there is such expression, you know, guardian of the convention. Uh, but if you read uh, convention very carefully, you may know that tribunal and its seabed dispute chamber carry out functions essential to the effective operation of the UNCLOS regime, which no other forums, uh, ICJ, Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal, Annex 8 Special Arbitral Tribunal, no other forums under Article 287 can carry out. So uh, I will explain. Uh, 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 so in that sense, uh, uh, tribunal is different from other uh, court uh, or tribunal under Article 287. It has a unique uh, function. Uh, it has a special status. That status I call uh, uh, kind of uh, status as the guardian of UNCLOS. Uh, now, quickly, uh, contentious jurisdiction of tribunal and chamber. Uh, contentious jurisdiction, uh, you may know that uh, this is a jurisdiction to decide a dispute, right? Uh, jurisdiction to decide, uh, to give a decision in dispute uh, between the parties. Of course, uh, this is a principal function of tribunal. Principal function of tribunal is a settlement of any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. Uh, this phrase, uh, any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. Very important uh, phrase. Uh, uh, the first thing we do in the tribunal when dispute is submitted to us is to determine whether dispute submitted is dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. Uh, anyway, principal function of the tribunal is settlement of dispute concerning uh, the convention. However, tribunal's jurisdiction go beyond settlement of dispute arising from the convention. It can deal with the dispute arising under other international agreement under certain conditions. So uh, uh, tribunal can deal with the dispute uh, concerning the interpretation or application of other agreements than the convention, then uh, Seabed Dispute Chamber has exclusive, near exclusive, almost exclusive, there are a couple of exceptions, but uh, almost exclusive compulsory jurisdiction over disputes with respect to activities in the area beyond national jurisdiction. So 
all those uh, disputes uh, then may arise uh, uh, from activities in the area beyond jurisdiction uh, will be, uh, must be submitted to CBET dispute chamber. Now, tribunal has also advisory jurisdiction. CBET dispute chamber has advisory jurisdiction. This is a really unique role a function of the tribunal and CBET dispute chamber. Uh, you know, uh, whether tribunal can uh, give an advisory opinion was a rather controversial issue, but uh, because it was not specifically explicitly uh, provided for in the convention, but this uh, question was settled and the uh, tribunal uh, uh, exercise such a jurisdiction in, in the case, uh, 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 in the request submitted by sub-regional fisheries commissions uh, back in 2015. Uh, therefore, uh, it is now clear that the tribunal uh, may give an advisory uh, opinion under certain conditions. On the other hand, uh, uh, the convention uh, specifically explicitly uh, provides that the CBET dispute chamber must give advisory opinion at the request of assembly or the council of the international CBET authority on legal question arising within the scope of its activities, their activities. So, uh, uh, this uh, advisory jurisdiction of the chamber was also exercised once before when Council of the International Seabed Authority uh, made a request uh, to the chamber for an advisory opinion. Uh, you know that the International Seabed Authority is one of the three uh, institutions created by the Law of Sea Convention. It, carries out very important function, uh, you know, this uh, development of uh, uh, seabed and its subsoil beyond national jurisdiction. And uh, 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 seabed dispute chamber plays an important role uh, in uh, clarifying, you know, legal uncertainty uh, Seabed authority may be faced with uh, in carrying out its uh, responsibility. So this is a, a function. This is one of the function, as I called, uh, uh, you know, this role, uh, tribunal and chamber, uh, being the guardian of uh, uncles. Access to the tribunal and chamber. This is an another uh, innovative feature of the tribunal and the chamber. Tribunal uh, uh, must be open to not only states parties, but also entities other than states parties, uh, in any case submitted uh, uh, pursuant to other agreement conferring jurisdiction on the tribunal. Uh, so, under certain conditions, uh, uh, non-state entities may appear before it laws. This is big difference uh, from ICJ. Uh, in case of ICJ, only states may appear before the court. CBET dispute chamber also is open to not only states, but also international organizations such as the authority uh, and even uh, uh, you know, state enterprise and natural and juridical persons. Uh, so uh, 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 CBET dispute chamber uh, is uh, uh, open to those entities, uh, not only states, but also non-state entities. Uh, now, uh, quickly, uh, another important uh, function uh, carried out by the tribunal 
is uh, this uh, so-called urgent proceeding. There are two types of urgent proceedings. One is a prompt release proceeding. Uh, ITLOS has near exclusive uh, jurisdiction over prompt release proceeding under Article 292 of the Convention. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Law of the Convention introduced, of course, exclusive economic zone, and coastal state has uh, uh, rather strong enforcement powers uh, in the exclusive economic zone, uh, such as uh, boarding, inspection, arrest and detention and judicial proceedings. When coastal states arrest and detains fishing vessel and crew for violation of its fishing uh, uh, regulation, uh, such vessel and crew, you know, this arrested vessel and crew must be released promptly upon uh, posting of bond or other security. But sometimes detaining state uh, uh, does not do so. Uh, then in that case, uh, uh, flex state of arrested vessel and crew can uh, institute this so-called prompt release proceeding. These proceedings are critical in ensuring the balance of interest between maritime or fishing states and coastal states under the convention. Coastal state may arrest fishing vessel for violation of its fishing regulation, but it should release those vessels upon posting of uh, a bond or security. If it doesn't do so, then a uh, tribunal can intervene and uh, 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 you know, uh, that is what uh, these prompt release proceedings are all, all about. This is another uh, uh, role as a guardian uh, of the UNCLOS uh, because uh, uh, tribunal through this proceeding uh, can achieve, uh, you know, can maintain this delicate uh, balance uh, between uh, maritime states and coastal states. Another uh, origin proceeding is uh, provisional measure proceedings. Uh, there are two types of provisional measures. Uh, uh, one is uh, under Article 290, Paragraph 1. The other is uh, under uh, Article 290, Paragraph 5. Especially this uh, uh, second type of provisional measure. You know, uh, this is related to uh, Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. Usually, it takes several months uh, before Annex 7 uh, arbitral tribunal is uh, composed. Uh, during this period, something may happen, you know. Then parties to dispute uh, wanted to, uh, you know, uh, 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 ask for provisional measures. But there is no Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. In that case, it was uh, until the constitution of arbitral tribunal can uh, deal with uh, this request for provisional measures and can pro prescribe a provisional measure. So this is a very important role uh, played by uh, it was in the absence of uh, an acceptable arbitral tribunal. Uh, so this is another example of uh, uh, kind of unique uh, role played by tribunal as a guardian of UNCLOS. Finally, quickly, it's not directly related to tribunal, but president of tribunal is an appointing authority when uh, uh, parties to dispute have uh, cannot agree upon the appointment of arbitrator uh, to compose Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you look at the Article 3 of the statute of the tribunal, uh, uh, there are procedures to compose Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. 
Uh, however, if parties are unable to agree on the appointment of arbitral tribunal, then president of tribunal plays an important role in, in the constitution of that arbitral tribunal. Now, uh, quickly, uh, advantage of tribunal, tribunal is a standing specialized court with competence over the law of sea dispute. Uh, this is one uh, big uh, uh, advantage of the tribunal over other uh, court. Uh, it was focused on law of sea dispute. Uh, second, ITLOS is more representative of various legal system and different regions uh, in its composition. Uh, access to non-state entities, this is also very in innovative features of ITLOS. Speedy, timely trial, especially urgent proceedings such as prompt release or provisional measure proceedings. Uh, you know, in those urgent proceedings, tribunal uh, can give an order uh, within uh, almost one month. So that is uh, quite extraordinary. If you know the, uh, uh, you know, how this international court uh, operates, uh, but uh, tribunal has uh, kind of uh, uh, established this practice uh, in which according to which tribunal is able to give a decision very timely manner. Finally, just some assessment. Uh, uh, so far, a tribunal has received more case, cases than any other procedure under Article 287. So far, 29 cases. As I said, uh, Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunal is a default forum, but uh, Tribunal has received more cases than this Annex 7 Arbitral Tribunals. Uh, case has been, have been submitted evenly in terms of region and the status of development. If you look at the, uh, you know, those 29 cases, uh, those cases are quite evenly divided uh, across the region, of course, the status of development. Uh, so hopefully, uh, uh, this can be this can mean something. Uh, uh, obviously, tribunal is uh, perhaps trusted by both developed and developing states. As activities in the area progress, more disputes are likely to be submitted to CBAT dispute chamber with its exclusive compulsory ju jurisdiction. Uh, I from time to time say uh, in the conference and so on. And uh, maybe in the future, uh, really the chamber, CBET dispute chamber will be, uh, will be really, uh, you know, uh, main body uh, uh, as, a dispute, as a dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, maybe in terms of number of uh, dispute uh, being submitted, uh, CBET dispute chamber may exceed uh, the tribunal, you know. Uh, such time will come in my view, I don't know exactly when. Uh, tribunal has played a special role as a default forum in developing case laws for prompt release and provisional measure. As far as prompt release and provisional measure under Article 290, Paragraph 5 are concerned, tribunal is a default forum, in fact. Uh, and as such, it has uh, played a key role in developing case laws. Tribunal's jurisprudence is considered to be a balanced combination of continuity and changes. Uh, I can give you a few examples in this regard, if you have questions. Uh, now, uh, while the number of cases the tribunal has dealt with so far is not large, uh, uh, it has made solid contribution to the rule of law SC by settling dispute uh, and clarifying and developing international law embodied in the convention. And finally, the tribunal has served as guardian of the convention, not only by ensuring the consistent interpretation and application of the convention, but also by clarifying 
the legal uncertainty faced by international seabed authority and facilitating the constitution and functioning of Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. I'll stop here and uh, uh, I'll be pleased to uh, have discussion with you about anything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Paik. Um, you have given us an extremely clear explanation of probably one of the most complicated parts of the convention, and that's part 15. Um, and and um, so thank you so much. And I invite our participants to ask questions. And I think Judge Paik is quite open. Uh, doesn't have to be directly on a provision of the convention, but questions maybe how the tribunal operates. Um, so uh, uh, if you can help me, Brian, I can't see everyone if we have hands up. Uh, otherwise, I, I will go ahead and ask a question, but I would like to first give our participants an opportunity. All right, do we have any hands up? I will give you a little time. Well, maybe then I will just ask a, a question. Um, I think you gave such a, a very good explanation of the different um, options that states have in choice of procedure and how it loss. Um, I think many people feel perhaps it loss should have been the the not should have been really the the primary the principal um, forum for settling disputes under the convention, but Annex Seven is the default. But there are also other, um, there's Annex 7, it laws, and then special chambers that you've explained. Can, can you explain the difference between the it laws tribunal, the Annex 7, and a special chamber? What makes them different? Because they are quite different. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Annex 7 uh, is uh, arbitration. Uh, a judicial settlement by standing, you know, permanent court. And, uh, um, you know, this semester I teach international dispute settlement and uh, I spent a couple of weeks uh, dealing with the uh, difference between judicial settlement and arbitration, uh, advantages and disadvantage of uh, judicial settlement, uh, those of arbitration and, and so on. But uh, um, um, I think that uh, not all states, uh, but uh, many states uh, feel more, uh, how to say, assured uh, with arbitration than judicial settlement uh, uh, because uh, they believe, uh, I don't know whether their belief is uh, correct, uh, but uh, they believe that they retain some control over uh, arbitration compared to judicial settlement, uh, especially in terms of composition of uh, uh, arbitral tribunal, uh, um, you know, Annex 7 arbitral tribunal is composed of five uh, members and uh, uh, then uh, each party to the dispute uh, uh, can choose one, you know, arbitrator uh, respectively, then remaining three arbitrators are appointed on the basis of agreement between the parties. Uh, uh, usually parties uh, cannot reach an agreement on the appointment of three arbitrators, but anyway, uh, they can choose at least one uh, and then remaining three, you know, somehow they can uh, uh, make some influence over the appointment. Uh, so they feel more uh, comfortable or assured uh, with arbitral tribunal. Uh, then, uh, for example, it was uh, where, you know, 
you have a predetermined 15 judges already sitting there. You have no choice, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, this is a big consideration uh, for the parties to dispute the, whether they whether they have to decide uh, to go to ITLOS or 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 arbit NX7 arbitral tribunal. Then now this special chamber. Special chamber uh, is, uh, you know, chamber composed of, uh, you know, a few judges, it can be five, uh, it, uh, it can be nine, you know. I was a member of a uh, special chamber uh, in Ghana Cote d'Ivoire case. That was uh, five, uh, but uh, each party uh, appointed ad hoc judge, uh, so, in fact, uh, uh, only three judges were mm. uh, appointed out of uh, 21 judges. Uh, so in the special arbitration, uh, parties may have limited choice hmm? uh, to choose, uh, you know, three judges out of uh, 21, you know. They cannot choose uh, uh, members of uh, chamber outside tribunal, but at least they can choose. You know, 21 is not a small number. <laughs> they can choose <laughs> three members, uh, you know, from uh, 20, this pool of 21. So uh, currently I'm involved with uh, this uh, dispute between Mauritius and Maldives. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and this is nine, but uh, there are two ad hoc judges. Uh, so seven members, uh, out of 21, one third. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, still, you know, parties can choose seven out of 21. So uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, not, of course, arbitration, but uh, it is, uh, you may say, halfway between judicial settlement and arbitration. Parties have uh, uh, not complete unfettered the freedom to choose uh, members of uh, you know uh, tribunal but uh, they have some at least uh, some you know uh, freedom some flexibility to choose uh, so uh, um, you know uh, uh, on the other hand arbitration is quite costly yeah. It's longer than judicial settlement. Uh, so there are some uh, downside as well. So uh, we clearly see this trend that the parties uh, sometimes uh, prefer hmm, a special chamber to, to uh, arbitral tribunal. Uh, so uh, um, I will... I expect that there will be more instances of uh, special chamber. I don't know whether this is a really uh, good development uh, to the tribunal, um, but uh, uh, I, I, this uh, trend uh, may continue at least for some time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Now it's interesting, I know that it's, it's been written quite a bit. Um, and really, I, I think, as you said, the many advantages actually of it loss, um, the judges are there, their views are known. It's not, it's quite transparent in that way. Um, the cost aspect, of course, it's the, the parties don't have to, except for their own counsel. And I have to say, you didn't have a photo. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful. <laughs> The tribunal is really just absolutely spectacular. So, so we would hope to see more cases going to going to the tribunal. Let me see if we have uh, another question. Uh, oh, is this uh, from you, Brian? Um, yes, but I see there's one from Kelvi, so maybe we'll just prioritize that instead. Yeah, Kelby, I mean, uh, from the Pacific region. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, absolutely, Kelvi. Thank you, Professor. I'm just checking whether you can hear me well or... Great. Uh, yes, um, thank you once again. Um, greetings to Judge Pike. It's good seeing you again. It's been a while. Good to see you. 
Um, I, I, I think I just just a question that more or less seeks for clarity, I suppose. Um, just 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 out of curiosity. So 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 my question pretty much relates to um, Article Two Nine Five, which is on the exhaustion of local remedies. Um, I, I was just wondering, like, like how, how, how does that work in practice um, in the case of, um, in relation to cases of um, prompt release of vessels and even cases that would require provisional measures? Mm -hmm. You know, like under 295, it says before you approach court and so forth, you, you'll pretty much have to exhaust local remedies first before approaching. That being the case, I'm just out of curiosity, how long does that take to actually, you know, have a case before it close to, to, to make any um, decisions on it? Mm. I guess that's, that's my question. Thanks. Mm. Uh, very good question. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 in several previous cases, uh, this uh, local exhaustion of local remedy was uh, involved uh, as a ground for uh, inadmissibility of a claim. You know, one party argued that uh, uh, the other party's claim is inadmissible because uh, it failed to exhaust the local remedies. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in many cases, uh, such uh, argument was not accepted. In case of uh, prompt release case proceedings, uh, I don't think uh, 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 this uh, exhaustion of local remedy uh, applies uh, to such uh, proceedings. If you look at the article 295, it says, uh, uh, you know, uh, it says uh, 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 after local remedies have been exhausted, uh, where this is required by international law, therefore you always have to decide whether it is a case. Uh, uh, which requires exhaustion of local remedy, but prompt release case, uh, I've never dealt with uh, myself uh, prompt release proceedings, uh, but uh, I don't think uh, this local remedies uh, uh, rule is applies to prompt release proceeding. Uh, by the way, uh, in a dispute involving arrest or detention of ship, uh, uh, Usually this question arises whether uh, local remedy should be exhausted when she is detained by coastal state for whatever reason, uh, then uh, 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 whether, you know, uh, before flag state uh, starts legal action against the coastal state, uh, whether uh, ship owner uh, should uh, exhaust local remedies available in coastal states? Uh, that question arises quite often. Well, it depends, uh, but uh, in many such disputes, uh, uh, for example, involving uh, uh, freedom of navigation in the EEZ uh, or uh, passage rights uh, in the territorial sea, and so on, uh, tribunal consider those rights or freedom uh, belong to flag state uh, rather than, uh, you know, uh, ships. Hmm? Mm. So, uh, for example, right of innocent passage uh, belongs to flag state. Therefore, when, uh, say, right of innocent passage is uh, uh, violated, uh, then flex state, flex state's right is violated. Therefore flex state uh, can, 
start legal action against coastal state as its own right was violated, uh, therefore without going through you know, local remedies uh, available in coastal states. Well, it depends on the case, uh, but uh, uh, tribunal uh, tend to interpret uh, uh, those rights, rights uh, of uh, passage, uh, freedom of navigation, uh, are uh, rights and freedoms of state hmm? uh, rather than uh, uh, right uh, granted to ship owner or ship operator. Good question. Yeah, that was. Thank you, Calvi. We are also enlightened by that question. Well, we've gone over our time, Judge Paik, um, and we know that you are a busy person. I don't think we have um, another question, although I have to say, uh, in my view, we could go on for a long time. There's so many <laughs> issues uh, from the cases to uh, going into the detail of the provisions of part 15. Uh, I know we talked about, you talked about the exceptions, but I would say, are those exceptions ever really applied? <laughs> <laughs> so lots of lots of questions, but we've run out of time. So we can only thank you so much, uh, Patricia. I should uh, also offer you a chance to to say a few words as well before we close the session. No, thanks, Nilfer. I want to just uh, join Nilfer in saying that we could have uh, uh, you for another lecture because there's still the issues certainly to be um, explored and. Uh, and, and certainly the, the future of the, 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 the tribunal uh, would be also very interesting to discuss because I'm sure that uh, uh, the um, um, tribunal will be increasingly increasingly used by uh, by member states and uh, and international organizations and so and I think there are some exciting developments possibly coming up also on the way from the from it was so I thank you for sharing your time uh, with us and the, the participants. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So we wish you all um, a good day, evening, wherever you are. And of course, tomorrow we continue uh, with the course um, that will be with um, uh, Ramesh Riramantri on investment disputes. So thank you so much, Judge Paig, really, for okay. this wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're getting Good lots of thank yous from the participants. Thank you. Thank just you. a quick note to the participants. Tomorrow we'll begin with a couple of exercises, just discussion on investment law problems. So if you have, so please do bring your thinking caps on and you know we will cover a bit more of investor state dispute settlement first before we go to international dispute resolution more generally. Thank you. And thank you, thank Judge you. Okay, bye-bye everyone.